Amen. Hey, put your hands together if you're ready for a word from God today. If you want to hear something from God, yeah, I'm ready. You can have a seat. God's moving and he's just getting started. Do me a favor. If you uh, grew up like I did in a home and you had to share like a bedroom with a sibling growing up, raise your hand. Who had to sh- yeah, there's quite a few of you. You had to share a room. See, I did too. So I'm the youngest of six kids, one brother, four sisters. So we each had our we, two, two, two. And um, there's, there's, there's good things and there's bad things about sharing a room with a sibling, isn't there? I mean, you might think, what's the good thing? Well, there's not many, but there are some good things, but I'll get to the, but there's bad first. The bad is you're sharing a room with somebody, and, uh, but the good is, like in my household anyway, it was freezing cold. When, I don't know if we ever had a heater growing up. I honestly have to ask my mom. It was freezing in our house, but my brother and I not only shared a room, but, and don't look at me like I'm weird, but we shared a bed. Like, I don't, I don't get it. I, don't, we, I think it was a queen size, but whatever. We shared a bed. And uh, it, the plus side is there's body heat when you share a bed with somebody, right? When you grow up with a sibling. But also, we did things to keep us warm as well. And, uh, don't, and you did weird things too. We just, you're just not talking about them right now. But I'll tell you one of mine. Um, we, uh, the most cold extremity on the body, I think, is the feet, right? My feet got freezing cold at night, and so did my brothers. So we would take turns putting our feet on each other's stomach to warm our feet up. So, yeah, that's, I'm just being honest with you. Pray for me. But we did this, like, every night. And that's one, one of the things we did. And I, I like that, right? But the other thing that I like, the, the thing I like most about sharing a room with my brother was this. Growing up, I was always scared. I, from, from a young age, I was always freaked out. Now, part of that is my, my brother and sister's fault. They would put me in front of movies. They'd watch movies, and they would think it's funny to throw Monty in front, like seven years old, watching movies like I grew up with, like The Exorcist or um, The Omen or The Shining. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those. If, don't go out. Yeah, don't, they freaked me out. And then there's the movie, uh, above all movies, that came out a little bit later, right? The movie that's wrong on about every different level. Uh, the movie called It, right? With the, with the clown, right? I mean, I'm just going to say it. If you or anybody you know dresses up like a clown for any occasion, number one, you have no friends. Okay, I'll just tell you that. Um, number two, uh, you need psychiatric help. I mean, don't be dressing up like a clown. I watched that movie and I was never the same again, ever. I, but, and you might, you might be thinking, Monty, okay, yeah, as a kid, you got scared, big deal. As a, what, what kid doesn't get scared? They watch scary movies, they get scared, right? But I'm going to tell you something else. I'll get more vulnerable with you. Not only did scary movies freak me out, but like family movies had, had an opportunity to freak me out. And, and not movies, but, but shows. Have you ever heard of or watched the show um, Little House on the Prairie? Anybody ever heard of it or watched it? Yeah, Little House on the Prairie. So some of you. So Laura Ingalls, like main character in that story. Well, Laura Ingalls had a friend named Nellie. Nellie was was like the mean friend, right? We've all got those mean friends that you go, every group's got like one mean friend. And if you don't know who it is in your group, then, then you're probably the jerk. So I'm just going to say it. Um, but uh, we've all got these mean friends. And Nellie was ne- mean. And I remember one episode with Nellie. She was riding a horse. And I think my mind kind of blocked out what actually happened. But something bad happened. And I remember being scarred by Little House on the Prairie. I mean, I, that's how bad it was for me growing up. I was just freaked out as a kid. I was the kid that would turn all the lights on in the house when no one was home to pretend like people were home. Kind of like Macaulay Culkin and Home Alone, right? You set up all the mannequins. But I wasn't set up setting up mannequins because that's, that's freaking too. So um, it was just, I was a scared kid growing up, and I hated that about myself. I hated the fact that even when I got to my teenage years, I was still always freaked out. Even staying at a friend's house, I was scared, and I hated that. I wanted that to change. I wanted it to change about me. So let me ask you a question today, this morning. Is there anything in your life, is there something in your life that you want to change? If there is, raise your hand. Something in your life that you want to change. Yeah, most of you, there's something in your life. I was going to ask, is there someone sitting next to you that you want to change? But I thought that'd make for a tense car ride home, so I won't ask that. But is there something in your life? Most of your hands went up. That doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me because there's things in my life that I want to change even today. A lot of things, to be honest with you. You know what? I got good news for you and I this morning. And I need you to tell your neighbor this good news. Tell them change is within reach. Tell your neighbor, change is within reach. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that change is within reach. This is the title of today's message. Change for you and I, it is within reach. And this is good news. This is good news. And and, uh, what I'm going to share with you, you know what, before I share it with you, I'm going to tell you something. Insanity, there's something about insanity. Because change, if you want something to change, you got to do something new, right? That's like the main point. I think we have that slide. If you want something to change, you got to do something new. Right? If you want something to change, you've got to do something new. Insanity is what? If you don't know the definition, I'll tell you. Insanity is when you continually go back to Walmart even though you know better. Even though, that was a joke, even though you know better. Some of you, it'll take a while. But even though you know better, that's insanity. 
I keep going back to Walmart. I don't know. It keeps taking me backwards in my walk with Jesus. But pray for me again. So, um, but insanity is when you do something over and over and you, you expect different results. So here's what I think about us sometimes, you and I. Sometimes we want God to change something in our life. God, I want this to change in my life. I want my marriage to change. I want my kids to change. I want my job to change. But we keep doing the same old thing. But no more. See, today's a new day. Say, today's a new day. Today's a new day. So there's two things I believe that we're going to focus on today that God wants us to look at in our lives that can change. Two areas, two arenas. One is ourself, right? We say we can't change others, but we can change us. The truth is only God can change us. But one of them is you. My prayer for you is that you're going to walk out of here different than you came. Okay? If you lean into this message today, you lean into what God has for you today, you will change. I promise you that. So, but God doesn't only want to change you. God wants you to change someone else. And you might think, well, we can't change other people. There, there's a certain demographic of people that you can have a huge influence on. So we're going to change you today, and we're, I'm going to show you how you can change the life of a child today. So I'm going to say it again. I'm going to show you how you can change the life of a child. Because child, children are still impressionable, right? They're still moldable. They're still pliable. So whether you're a parent, or this isn't just for parents, whether you're a parent, a teacher, a coach, a mentor, a friend, an aunt, an uncle, it doesn't matter. You're going to have children in your life that you can influence. And, and, and Jesus talked about it, and that's what we're going to look at today. But I'm going to tell you why this is so crucial and, and why children's ministry is our most important ministry at Meadows Church. Some of you that are brand new, you don't know that yet. Now you do. It's our most important ministry. Why? A couple reasons. Number one is a person's moral foundation, studies will tell you this, a person's moral foundation, what, what they think is right and what they think is wrong in life, that is basically formed by the time they're nine years old. By the time they're nine, that's formed. So right now you're thinking, great, so if my kid's 10, I'm screwed? Yes, you are. Throw in the towel. Give it up. No, I'm just kidding. You're not. But it's, by nine years old, by nine years old, they formed what they think is right or wrong. Not only that, but when it comes to Christianity, um, kids are making a determination about the death and resurrection of Jesus, which, by the way, defines Christianity. Like, there's, there's thousands of religions out there, right, that believe, some believe God, some believe Jesus, but Christi the, the Christian faith believes in the event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he was God's son, that he, rose, that he died and he rose again, that this miracle happened. We believe that. And children, they, de they determine whether that's true or not true normally by the time they're 12. By the time they're in fifth slash sixth grade, they've made that determination for the most part. For the most part. This is why our kids' ministry is, is crucial. I say it all the time. Our kids' ministry is three things. Safe, fun, and life-changing. And somebody said to me, and I, and I always say, what's in the center of it? What's in the center of that? Fun. Fun. It's always in the center. Well, Jesus needs to be in the center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. But you know what? That's the life-changing part. But they're a kid. And sometimes we forget they're a kid. And if it's, if it's not fun, they're, really, they're probably not going to care much about, you know, they're kids. They want to have fun. So if it's not fun, it's like when I, when I went to church, I disengaged because I wasn't, it didn't capture my attention. You want, they're kids. Let them have fun. They'll get to the Jesus part, I promise. They'll get to the life-changing part. But they will never get there if it's not fun, if it doesn't engage them. That's why I love this church that we have kids that actually wake up and want to go to church. Some of you parents are here today because your kids were jumping on you this morning saying, hey, is it Sunday? Is it Sunday? I wasn't doing that growing up. I was running. I was hiding. I was in the closet under the bed praying my mom wouldn't find me when it came to church. I'm just being honest with you. But I think sometimes we, we, we think we have to sit in church and just be all prim and proper, don't we? Well, this is church. We've got to sit quietly, right? Don't talk or smack. You know what? I want us to relax. I want us to say, you know what? We can get a little loud in church. We can have some enthusiasm in church, not just in kids' ministry, but in here. And this is, yeah, yeah, so give God a shout right now. Give him a praise right now. Relax a little bit. Open up a little bit. God's in this place. He wants to do something in you today. I'm excited. Enthusiasm. Do you know the word enthusiasm? Do you know what the Greek root words are? N, N, enthusiasm, theos, right? In God. The word literally means in God. That's what the word means. That's why I think, why are we more enthused? Why aren't we more excited? See, the more you get into God, the more that God's spirit gets into you. This is why at this church, we believe that church should look less like a funeral and more like a party because we have something to celebrate. We got something to celebrate. Jesus is on the throne today. It's a good day. It's a good day. It's a God day. If you brought a Bible or a mobile device with a Bible app, go to the Gospel of Mark. That is the second book in the New Testament. And if you don't have those things, it's cool. We're going to put it up on the screen as well. But so, so Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 
are the four stories of Jesus. They're, they start the New Testament. Old Testament is before Jesus came to earth as a, as a child. New Testament, after Jesus came to earth, right? So in Mark, uh, go to chapter 10, and I'm going to give you four verses today. We're going to start in the 13th verse. And um, I'm so excited about the word. So in, the, in verse 13, this is what it says. It says, one day, say one day. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering Jesus. When Jesus saw this, what was happening, what the disciples were doing, he became angry. I got to pause there for a second. Sometimes I think we picture Jesus as this meek, mild mannered guy who never got upset. You're not picturing the right Jesus, okay? Jesus got ticked off. Jesus got upset. This is an example. Jesus was angry. Another translation says indignant. He was ticked. The, well, he, the difference is with his anger, he didn't sin in it, right? It was righteous anger, but he was mad at the disciples. He was ticked. And, and listen to what he says. Check this out. So he was angry with his disciples, and then Jesus said, let the children come to me, he said. Don't stop them. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these kids, who are like these children. Do you know what I love about Jesus right here? See, when Jesus walked the earth, like women and kids were like secondary. In that culture, they were secondary. Like the men were the big deal, and then there was all the women and the kids. But Jesus, you know what's so exciting about Jesus? He cared about people nobody else cared about. He, that's what he's in the business of doing. Some of you, you walked in here, you walked in here today wondering, does anybody care about me? Does anybody love me today? Is there any hope for me today? I'm here to tell you, Jesus is your hope. And he's looking down at you right now, and he loves you. And he wants to care for you. And he wants to wrap his arms around you and hold you and tell you that you're his child, and he has great plans for your life. This is what God wants you to know. Jesus cared about the people that no one else cared about. The kids, he said, let them come to me. And then he goes on to say, I tell the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Boy, that's interesting. We're going we're to come back to that later. Then he took the children in his arms. I love this picture. He placed his hands on their heads, and Jesus blessed them. Jesus blessed the children. Church, if we want something to change in our life or the future generation that God has blessed us with and entrusted us with, if we want something to change, you've got to do something new. So at the end of this message, I believe God will speak to you and he will tell you, this is what I want you to do. This is, what, this is something new that you can do in your life. If you want something to change, you need to do something new. What did, the, what did the parents do? The first thing they did, what they did that was new, they brought their kids to Jesus. They brought their children to Jesus. As I read that scripture, I wonder how many parents didn't do that. It talks about the parents that brought their kids to Jesus. How many parents didn't do that? How many parents back in this day never, oh, well, yeah, Jesus, he's all cool, but we got other things going on. We got, you know, you play dates and all this stuff, and they didn't bring their kids to Jesus. These are the parents that did. They brought them to Jesus. They brought them to Jesus. We believe something in this church. The closer you get to Jesus, the more he's going to change your life. I promise you that. Another impossibility is this. You can't get closer to Jesus and not change. That is impossible. That is impossible. And the closer that we bring our children to Jesus... And I'm not just talking to parents here today. You're going to have, you're going to have kids um, that you can impact, I promise you. The closer we get our kids to Jesus, the more their lives will change. But as for parents, I'll speak to you for a second. Your number one priority, and my number one priority as a mom or a dad, is, is to gra gradually transfer the dependence of our kids from us to God. That is your number one job. It's your not above all else. That is what God wants us to do. So when they hit 18 or 9, whatever, 18 years old, they no longer are depending on us. You know, we hope not anyway. And they're depending on God. If, you, if you've accomplished that, you've succeeded. Not only have you succeeded, succeeded, you've knocked it out of the park. This is what God wants. So how do we bring our kids to Jesus? We always say you can't give out what you don't have. You can't lead someone to where you haven't been, right? So, so as, as parents or as adults in, with kids around us, what do you need to do? You need to love the Lord. What's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. If you're doing that, it will pour out into the kids around you. Did you know that? You, that, that so you can't give out what you don't have. The best thing you can do for the kids in your life or around, your, around you is that you love the Lord and you show them that. So I'll say, I'll say it this way. I'm super proud of you for being here today. Because one of the number one ways that you will show the future generation that God matters to you is when you worship him. 
And when you make the Sabbath holy, and when you get to church, whether you lose an hour or not, it doesn't matter. I just need to get closer to Jesus. I need to get closer to his word. I need to get closer to his truth because Jesus sets people free, and I want my kids to know it. So attending church on a regular basis is a big deal. And if you know anything about the future generation, they're not flocking to the church, okay? Most of them are flocking from it. But we can make an impact. We can impact their life. Did you know that uh, studies will tell you that when both parents go to church, or when parents go to church, the chances of those kids going to church when they get older, 72%. 72% that those kids will go to church on a regular basis when their parents go to church. If if neither mom or dad goes to church, it drops from 72% to 6% that they'll go to church. See, what I want us to understand is it's not so much what we tell our kids. A lot of times it's what we show them. If you make church a priority, if you make the Sabbath a priority, if you make worship a priority, if you make God's word a priority, your kids will see it and it will impact them. I promise you, this is how you can love the Lord your God. You bring your kids. You bring your families. And check them in. I always encourage you to check them in. And and, and new people, I always tell bring them in. Bring your kids in here. Let them experience all of it. But eventually, I believe you'll get to a point where you'll you'll want to check them in. When you get comfortable, you'll want to check them in. Because our kids' ministry is second to none. Right? I don't know about the pastor of this church. He's kind of sketchy. But I'm telling you, our kids' ministry, it's amazing. It's amazing what's going on in there. Safe, fun, and life-changing. The children in our kids' ministry, I believe they are going to change the world. I, I say it all the time. They will, I promise you. Because we're teaching them to fall in love with Jesus. We are teaching them to fall in love with Jesus. And here's what I already know about you. You want that. As a parent, you want that. You want them putting their faith in Jesus. You don't want them putting their faith in their friends. I know you don't. You don't. You don't want them putting their faith in their Facebook page. You don't. You want them putting their faith in Jesus. Devil's trying to distract me. I'm not going to let him do it, right? You want them putting their faith in Jesus. I already know that about you. So, so your kids, so we're teaching them in kids' ministry to love Jesus and love the church. That's key. My mom taught me to love Jesus from from the day I was born, I believe. But one thing I didn't do growing up is I didn't love the church. See, I left the church as quick as I could at 18 years old. I couldn't wait to get away from it. To me, it was irrelevant. It was boring. um, Whatever. It just didn't apply to my life. But, But what we're doing here now, it's a new day. I didn't have kids ministry where I went to church. We are teaching our kids to fall in love with Jesus and making it fun for them. Many of you parents, you already know this. But check this out. When, when, our, when our kids fall in love with the church, um, it, it, it changes lives. It, it changes their life when they, when they have a good connotation of the church. But that wasn't me. In fact, I remember, I remember a conversation with my mom. And I, I woke up on a Sunday and I said, Mom, I, I'm not having it. I, I don't feel like going to church. And my mom's like, I don't care what you feel like. You're going to church. And I'm like, Mom, I'm not going. She said, Monty, you're going to church. I'll give you two reasons why. She said, number one. You're 38 years old. Number two, you're the pastor of the church. I'm like, fine, I'll go. You know, whatever. <laughs> Technicality. But uh, yeah, so anyway, um, we, 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 we point our kids to church. Here, but I'll be very, very open with you. The, what I want our kids to know, because why many kids will leave the church, is that they grow up thinking the church is a place for perfect people. They think that the church is a place where people got it all together. We get all dressed up, we get all gussied up, and we go to church and we pretend like we got it okay. We ain't got nothing okay. Okay, none of us are okay. I'm far from it, far from okay. And I want my kids to know that the church is a place where it's okay to not be okay. I want my kids to know that the church is a place for broken people can come and love and let God put us back together. That's what I want our kids to know. I don't want them thinking, oh, this church, you know, the church is full of sinners and hypocrites. I know it is. I I wouldn't be here if it wasn't, right? I drop the ball every day. One of my biggest fears as, as as a pastor and as a parent is that my kids will one day, and, and I think about it all the time, it's the biggest fear I have, one of the biggest fears, is that my kids will leave the God or leave the church because of the way I am. And I tell my kids all the time, your dad, I, they, they already know this, but your dad will let you down. I will let you down. But I promise you, God, Jesus, he will never let you down. The church, the people in the church will let you down. But the global church, the bride of Christ, it's beautiful. It's God's plan. He died for it. And it, as broken as it is, it's still his plan. But, but, but I want my kids not to look at dad and think, I'm Jesus. I'm so far from that. My kids need to know who Jesus is. And many kids, what they see growing up is, oh, the church is this perfect place. And when they realize it's not, they run from it because they think that it's, it's, it's a facade. So I want my kids to know this is a place where people are hurting. This is a place where people are broken. If we can't be real in church, where can we be real? Okay. We talked about in the, in the series, The Real Me. If you haven't watched that series, you can go back and watch it. Incredible what God had to share in that, in that series. So I want our kids to love Jesus and love the church. It's what we want.
It's what we want. So bring your children to Jesus, right? Bring your kids to Jesus, whatever it takes, but you can't give out what you don't have. Number two, love your children like Jesus. Love your children like Jesus. So you might think, okay, yeah, that seems pretty elementary, but, but I want you to think about something for a second. Think about the scripture that, that, that God had for us today. Think about what the disciples were doing. Think about it for a second. When the disciples were doing this with the families, when the disciples were doing this with the kids, did they think they were doing the wrong thing? Mm -mm. They didn't. Not at all. They thought they were doing exactly what Jesus wanted. They thought, if you would have asked Peter, are you doing the will of God right now? He would have been like, yes. We are doing the best thing. Jesus, he, you know, he don't have time for that right now. He's doing important stuff. So they're keeping the kids away. They're, they're doing this. And they thought they were doing the right thing, didn't they? So interesting. I wonder how many times as parents with our kids and with our family, even not as parents, again, as adults that you have an influence in kids' lives, I wonder how many times we think we're doing the will of God. We're, we're doing what's best for our kids. We're keeping our kids happy. And I wonder if Jesus is up thinking, this is not the idea. That you're missing it, Peter. You're missing it, John. You're missing it, Matthew. You're missing it, Monty. You're not doing my will. You think your, your will is to keep your kids happy? It's to make them holy. It's to bring them closer to me. Now, does the Lord want your kids full of joy? Of course he does. He's the giver of joy. He is the giver. But, but I think sometimes, and I've been guilty of this, so don't act like I got it all figured out. I don't. But, but a lot of times, we think we keep our kids busy, we keep our kids going, and we stay active. And if they're doing that, I'm going to do that, and we're going to do soccer, we're going to do baseball, we're going to do football, we're going to do basketball, and we're going to do drama, and we're going to do acting. You know, we're, we're doing all these things. And in our head, we think we're doing the best thing. We're doing what a lot of people are doing. Well, that should be a clue that you're probably doing the wrong thing, to be honest with you. It, it, honestly, Jesus says a, a few are on the road that leads to life. So if, you, if, you, if your life looks a lot like everybody else's, you probably want to make a change. I'm just being honest, and I'm preaching to me as much as I'm preaching to you, but I'm telling you, sometimes we're so busy doing all these things for our kids, we're not doing the best thing for them. The disciples thought they were doing what they were supposed to do, and Jesus says, you're doing the exact opposite. It's like he was angry with them. Are you kidding me? You're missing it. You're missing it, he said. Our, and our kids are watching us. If they see that baseball practice is more important than church, you don't, have to t you don't have to talk and tell them. You're showing them. You're showing them. And my kids are in sports. They are. They're, I want them in stuff. I think that's healthy. But one, one thing my kids know is, is we're not skipping worship. We're not going to get in the way, you know, if there's something on Sunday or whatever, a church time, we ain't doing it. And they don't even talk about it. They know. They know. But it's taken me time to learn that. I didn't just know that. I just, it took me time. God had to beat me down to, to get that into my life. But at the end of the day, our kids don't know what's best, do they? They think they do, Matt. If you've got teenagers, who's got teenagers in the house, right? And if there's teenagers in here, I'm sorry. You can, you can talk to me later. But you don't know what's best. You don't know what's best, right? You don't know what's best. If my daughter, Ava, she's 12 years old. If my daughter, Ava, got what she thought was best, she would be selling her kidney on eBay for an iPhone 8 Plus. That's what she would be doing, okay? If she got what she thought was best, that's what she'd be doing right now. Ava, you ain't getting no iPhone. I just tell her straight up with it. And you know what she says to me? It's what you've heard a lot if you're a parent. I guarantee you've heard it. Dad, that's not fair. It's not fair. I love hearing that because every time I hear that, I'm like, I'm doing God's will. I'm doing God's will. Every time I hear that's not fair, I'm doing God's will. I'm doing it. Good job, Mom. You know, I'm doing God's will. That's not fair. I said, I said Ava, I'm going to make family t-shirts. It says, life's not fair. I don't care. Love, Dad. Right? I mean, I just love that because life's not fair. It isn't fair. Quit... Well, that's not fair. No, it's not fair. You're right. Your kids, yeah, I get other kids. I don't care. Life's not fair. If life was fair, would Jesus have been nailed to a cross? The guy never sinned. He never did nothing wrong. And we hammered him to a tree and killed him. If anybody knows that life's not fair, it would be Jesus. Okay? Life is not fair. You're correct, Ava. It is not fair. Back to the scripture. I want to show you something. Mark 10, 13. We've already read it, but I want to highlight something. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them. I've never noticed it before. I've never noticed it before. I've read this scripture before. I've never noticed where I said touch them. I never have. And I don't know if all translations, I don't know, but I'm just saying the, the, this one that I'm looking at, the NLT, he says touch them and bless them. I knew Jesus blessed them, but touch them? And as I look at that, I'm thinking to myself, there's a couple things he did in Matthew, or Mark 10, 13. The loving touch is huge. And I think sometimes we miss this. And parents, I'll just tell you straight up, especially with your teenagers, I will encourage you straight up, 
to hug your children. Hug your children. They may hate it. They may run from it. But I promise you, deep inside their heart, they don't hate it. And they may not, you may not never know that until years later. But give your children a loving touch. Okay? Give your children a loving touch. Don't, no, don't go home with your teenager and say, Pastor said I need to give you a loving touch and swat them alongside the head. I said a loving touch. Right? A hug. I, I, kids are dying for it. And, and I just caught that. I'm like, Jesus touched them. He could have blessed them just by doing this, right, over them. But no, no, no. He brought them in. And he brought them into his arms, it said. Hug your kids. Give them that loving touch. It's so huge. The other thing he, that he did was, was time. touch and time are the two things I wrote down. Touch and time. In Matthew, or Mark 10, 13, he, he touched them and then he had time for them as he blessed them. He had time for them. But again, I'll go back to the busyness in our lives. And I don't have to tell you that. You know that. A study tells, says that in the last 50 years that parents spend 10 to 20 less hours a week with their kids than they did 50 years ago. 10 to, tw 10 to 20 hours a week. That's huge percentage rights. That's huge. Uh, I have something that we say in this church a lot that has to do with 10 minutes. I always say that in God's word, 10 minutes a day for the rest of your days will change your days. I promise you, if you read God's word 10 minutes a day for the rest of your days, it will change your days. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes a day with your kids. You might think that's not much. Well, it's, it's more than a lot of us are doing. 10, in, 10 minutes a day of uninterrupted time with your kids. Uninterrupted. Or with a kid in your life. Maybe, not, maybe you're not a parent again. With a child in your life. If you give them 10 minutes, you're not going to fight with them. You're not going to get a reply. You're just going to listen. Now with your girls, with your daughters, <laughs> they might go longer than 10 minutes, right? We, we know how that goes. Your, God, your, your sons, they might just sit there. <clears throat> just grunt at you. I don't know what they're going to do. But you just give them that 10 minutes. You give them that 10 minutes, I promise you. I, if you do that for 30 days with your kids, 10 minutes of uninterrupted, let them talk. Let them talk. Let them talk. Let them talk. 10 minutes, let them, let them spill it out. In 30 days, your life, with, your relationship with them will be much different. I promise. I promise. I promise. Jesus had touch for them. Jesus had time for them. The parents wanted change. They did something new. If you want change, you got to do something new. And some of you are thinking, okay, this is great. Sounds like it's for parents, but it's not just for parents. God's trusted us with the future generation of this world. Kids are a big deal. And I'm so excited. I wasn't even going to talk about this in the message, but I can't help it. Our, our youth, 6th grade through 12th grade, will be starting a youth program in April, just twice a month, just starting off slow, t two Wednesdays a month. And I, 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 so I'm sorry to the youth guys. I know I wasn't going to say anything, but I can't help it. I'm just so excited about it. I, I love pouring into kids. They're the future of our church. They're the future of the world. They're a big deal. Children matter. So I want to say something to everybody here. You can make an impact in a child's life, and they desperately want it. There's an organization in town that, I've, that some of you are familiar with that I've got to meet with called Teammates. Teammates is a, is a mentoring organization started by Tom Osborne, the, the coach of the Huskers from years back. So he started it 25 years ago with football players, not on purpose, just some football players who are going to love on kids for an hour a week. It's grown exponentially over 25 years, and now it's huge in, in Nebraska and Iowa and other states. And it's a mentoring program where you spend an hour a week with a child. One hour. One hour. One hour a week over a lunch hour that you go to a school, you go in there and you just love on the kid. You play games, hang out with them, talk to them, read books, whatever. You just love them. That will change their life. So I'm so excited. So when you leave here today, there's a table that's being set up probably right now by Hannah. She's the assistant to Tom Osborne. She's setting up a table right now. And if you want information about that, stop by that table. Um, I'm going to mentor a kid. I'll tell you straight up. I'm not going to preach it and not practice it. I can't wait. And the school that we're adopting is called Golden Hills Elementary. It's the, one of the closest elementary schools to um, our location right here. But I'll tell you this. You don't have to do it there. Maybe you work in a different area of Omaha, and that's not convenient. Teammates is all over. So we just recommend that one if you don't know where to go. Um, but you can go wherever. Go wherever is convenient for you for a lunch hour. But let me tell you the impact that it's going to make. First of all, I'm going to tell you this. When I talked to Hannah this week, she said thousands of kids are waiting. Thousands is all. In, the, in just the Omaha area, thousands of kids are waiting. And some of them have been waiting for years, begging, crying out for help, crying out for attention, crying out for love. They're begging for it. And here's some stats I'll, I'll, show, with, I'll show you. This one hour a week, you don't think it'll make a difference? 55% show academic improvement when they're mentored by an adult. 55% their grades are getting better. 72% have fewer unexcused absences. 72%. 85% have fewer disciplinary referrals. That's huge. 78% are more likely to volunteer regularly when they, get, when they become an adult. 
you, you don't think an hour will make a difference a week? It will change a child's life. I mean, I, I, I won't guarantee it'll change the whole world, but it'll, it'll change that child's world. I promise you that. I promise you that. And the kids are crying out for it. And, and if we think about where we're at today in our society, and what do we hear about? The future generation. They're all messed up, and the millennials are all messed up. Are you kidding me? You know what I look at when I see our kids? I see hope, and I see potential, and I see, I see people hungry for change. That's what I see. I see opportunity. But I also see kids that, that don't have it all together, just like we don't but they're desperately needing a leader. They're begging for it. They are begging for it. We talk about the school shootings, right? All the sh shootings going on in the school, now more than ever. What do you think the, pro you, and we can point the finger all over the place, but I'll tell you what the Bible says about it. Here's what the Bible says the problem is. You know, you know what's starting all that, where that's initiating from? The Bible says our struggle is not against, against flesh or blood. That's what the Bible says. It's not flesh or blood. It, the Bible says that it's against the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of the dark world. Our enemy is the devil. Make no mistake about it. He will shield himself and he will de deceive us. That's why one of his names is the de de deceiver. He wants us pointing the finger everywhere. And he wants us going on social media and fighting about, oh, the kids are the problem or the guns are the problem. Whatever. The devil is the problem. And he knows if he can sink his teeth into our kids, he's going to make a dent. He's, he's, he's going to make a difference. He's after them. Okay? Make no mistake about it. The Bible says he prowls around like a lion, sinking claws into the kids. It's what he does. And he has no mercy. But we know somebody who's defeated the devil. The Bible says that the, the devil is already underneath our feet. The Bible says that we've already won the battle. So we need to step into that and show these kids the love of Jesus. Show them the power of Jesus. Show them what Jesus has to offer in their life. It's what God is calling us to do. It's what he's begging us to do. And you might think, Pastor, I know what you're saying. Jesus is the answer, but that's the issue. See, the schools, they've taken prayer out. That's the problem. The school says we can't bring the Bible in. Well, you know what we can bring in? You. And if you have the love of God, that means you bring the love of God into the school. And if you know God, you bring God's word into the school. And if you know God's son and surrendered to him, then you bring the love and the power of the Holy Spirit back into the school and into the kids and love them like Jesus. That's what he says. This is what God is calling us to do. We're going to make an impact in a child's life. God is calling you to do it. Okay, so I get a little bit excited. Remember enthusiasm, it's okay, it's all God. Um, I just wonder how different my life would look <laughs> with a mentor. I'm just going to be open with you. I, that's what I told God. I said, I'll be real with them. They might not like it. They might leave the church because maybe he's too brass. He's too out there. No, I'm always going to be real. I just, it's who I am. Um, you know, I told you earlier about how I get scared all the time when I was a kid. So I'm not sure that it was a movie more than a moment. Uh, so I'm the youngest of six, so I was uh, 10 years old, and we were in Salem, South Dakota, that's where I grew up, but we lived on a farm 15 miles out. So we were there for like the end of school elementary like concert. And uh, me and my sisters, my brother was home, my dad was home. And uh, we finish up at, at Salem singing for the, for the parents, and we're outside. I'll never forget it. This is the moment. We're outside, and I'm 10, and, and we're getting ready to jump in the station wagon because when you have that many kids, you need a station wagon. And uh, all of a sudden, Main Street, Salem, we see an ambulance go. And we're like, oh. So we jump in our station wagon, and we start heading out. We're 15 miles out of town. So we're going, and the ambulance, we're just following it the whole time. And we're like, oh, I wonder what's going on. You know, lights are going, sirens are going. And... Uh, we go, and it's going a long ways, like 12 miles one way, and then it turns on the gravel road, our gravel road. And so we turn and we follow it. And I'm like, this is crazy. And I'm, I just, you know, I'm 10 years old. I'm like, this is weird. What's happening? Is our neighbors, you know, what's going on? Something on, you know? All of a sudden it turns again in our driveway. And we follow it. We turn in our driveway, and I'll, I'll never forget it. It was weird. There was people in our house already, like, doing dishes and stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? And, and the rest, it's kind of a blur, but what I do remember is walking into the house and seeing people doing dishes and adults around, a lot of people I didn't know. And, uh, and I remember sitting down by the kitchen and uh, I remember looking in the living room and seeing uh, an adult with a blanket on and just with feet sticking out. And my, then my mom kind of walked over to me 
And I remember my sister or brother, my sister's being around, and my mom's like, um, Monty, your dad's gone. And I just remember sitting there, it was kind of like surreal. And uh, I remember that night I was sleeping with my brother in the same bed, you know the story. And the priest came up the stairs. I don't know what he said. I'm, I just wonder how different my life would look. See, there's studies that will tell you when children get to be, when they're 10 years or less, they kind of gravitate towards mom a lot of times. But a lot of studies will say when they're 11 years old and, and, and through 18, they gravitate more towards dad sometimes, especially sons with dads. And I never knew that. I mean, I never had that. So my dad was gone when I was 10. And uh, my mom did her best to raise us. You know, a single mom. We had no money, nothing. She's working three jobs. We're, we're out, you know. And I lived a life where I would go to church, but I would not, li- I would not back it up. And, and I'm telling you, I was called into ministry, I believe, when I was young. I didn't, I didn't really do ministry uh, until starting 10 years ago. So there's a lot of years in between there where I wasn't living out God's call in my life. I wonder if someone would have mentored me. I wonder if someone would have poured in me. I had no male, fit, male, male role models in my life. None. The kids I was hanging out with, we were doing what kids do. It wasn't good. And, um, and I did that for a lot of years. And I think back and I wonder, I don't want to focus too much on the past because it's the past, but yet it's who I was. And I think back and I think, if I would have had a dad, and, I don't, and I've screwed up as a dad so much, we won't even get into that, you don't have that kind of time right now, but I mess up so bad. And a counselor told me once, he's like, you don't even know how to be a dad, because we learn from being a dad from our dad. And I think, but we have an opportunity to pour into the younger generation and love them and mentor them, especially parents that are single family parents or parents that got, got a lot going on and struggling. And I think, how different would my life be? So I don't know a lot about being a dad, to be honest with you, because my dad is gone. Um, but one thing I did learn with my kids, I'll tell you this. I do know that, they're, that, that a father wants their kids to find them. And the reason I know that is because I used to play hide-and-seek when my kids were younger. We'd play hide-and-seek. And, seek. and uh, I'd always, I, not always, but sometimes I'd hide, like, in the bathtub and you'd close the shower curtain. And my kids, I don't know if they just aren't that smart or what, but they would keep looking for me in the wrong spots. And then they'd go back and keep looking in the same closet. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, if I wasn't there the first time, I'm not going to be there the second time. But anyway, that's another story, too. So I'm like, so eventually you want your kids to find you. So I start making noises in the shower, like, hey, hey. And then they start to follow the noise. You know why I was doing that? Because I was their dad. And I wanted them to find me. I desperately wanted my kids to find me. For somebody in this place today, God brought you here today because he's your father. And he wants to find you today. He want, he, like he's calling your name. He's like in the shower, hey, hey. And he's wanting you to come closer to him. This is what he's asking for. One more quick verse I, I want to show to you. Mark 10, 15. If you want something to change, you need to do something new. Mark 10, 15, I tell you the truth, Jesus is speaking. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God is like a child who will never enter it. What does that mean? The way to the Father is through the Son. The way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. When you believe in Jesus, you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Heaven is your home. A lot of people believe in Jesus like I did most of my life, but they just won't live for him. They won't surrender to him. The Bible says the demons believe, the devil believes, more than we ever will. They've never doubted the existence of Jesus. But by, but by grace through faith, Jesus says, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith when you believe. So, so what does Jesus mean when he says you, you, you can only come to heaven as a child? This is, what, this is what I believe he means, and most scholars will tell you the same thing. The purest form of faith is the faith of a child. It's the purest form. Think about a child. Think about the innocence of a child. You think about the wonder of a child. Think about the excitement of a child. It's the purest form of faith. This is what Jesus is saying. Childlike faith, that's the answer. You complicate it. Childlike faith, you overthink it. Childlike faith, you just need to believe it. Childlike faith says if you're an adult and you're with a child and you're at you're the street, and if you tell that child and they love you and they trust you, you tell that child to step out the street, they're going to do it. They love you. You love them. They trust you. They're probably, they probably won't even look both ways because you're with them and they trust you. You said it. But we overcomplicate it. Jesus is saying, come to heaven as a child. Childlike faith by faith, trusting others to care for them. That's what kids do. By faith, they trust us to lead them. By faith, they trust us to love them. By faith, they trust us to say, you can step out the street and I'm right here. And it's okay, it's safe. This is what God says. So when God says that he loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us, 
that he says, whoever would believe in my son Jesus won't perish, but you will live now abundantly and you will live forever eternally. That's what Jesus says. By faith, he says, will you accept it? That's childlike faith. Childlike faith says, I believe it because my father said it and he loves me. I believe it because my father said it and he loves me. We don't need to overcomplicate it. Childlike faith. I believe Jesus is God's son because my father said it and he loves me. I believe that Jesus died on a cross and that forgives all of my sins because my father said it and he loves me. I believe that Jesus three days later would rise up from the grave to defeat sin and defeat death. Why? Because my father said it and he loves me. And I believe that Jesus is coming back again someday because my father said it and he loves me and he loves you and you and you. He loves you. If you want something to change, you need to do something new. For some of you, what needs to change needs to happen now or after the service with the prayer team. And that is this. God is doing a work in your heart right now and you know it. God is calling to you right now and you know it. He's like in the shower and he's calling. He's saying, come to me, come to me, come to me. And he's getting louder and louder. And he's begging you to walk towards him with arms wide open. He's saying, I will love you. I will, I will walk with you. I will guide you across the street. I will do what fathers do. Maybe you didn't have an earthly dad like me. You have a heavenly dad. Way better than anything you could ever have here. Way better. And he loves you. So for somebody here today, the biggest change can happen here. I had it here growing up. I'll be honest with you. I had the head knowledge of Jesus. Knew all about him. Knew scriptures. Believed in Jesus. And I did. If it's here, you won't run from the bride of Christ. You'll run to it. I wasn't running to it. Just being honest. So for somebody here, for many people here, I believe, that God is wanting to change you. And then you you will impact others like you've never seen before. So this is what I'm asking. The gospel of Jesus Christ says, anyone who calls on his name will be saved. I'm not going to make you stand. I'm not going to make you raise your hand. I'm not going to do anything. What I do want you to do is this. If God is calling your name, if God is, God is calling you out and saying, I want all of you. Maybe you've surrendered bits and pieces. Maybe you believe, but you haven't surrendered. And you know you're not living for him. And today is your day. If that's you, what I'm going to ask is this. After we get in sing- singing this final worship song, after this final worship song, that we will have a prayer team lined up here. And I'm asking that you will come up and just let them pray with you. Just let them pray with you. Just let them pray with you. That's it. And, and, and even if you need prayer for anything, anything, that's why we're here. Don't leave here if you need prayer. That's why we're here. We love you. God loves you more than I ever could. He loves you. But if you, if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, all of you, you, you can fill out the connection card, but it's way bigger than checking a box. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ that will change your life, and he wants it. And you will never regret that decision. So if that's you, don't leave this place without praying with somebody. Fill out those cards so we know we can celebrate them, we can pray with you, and we can just give God all the glory because he gets it. He deserves it. He loves you. Have I mentioned that yet? He loves you. He loves you. Let me pray for you. Father, I want to thank you so much for the example of your son, Jesus Christ. If we want something to change God, We need to do something new. I pray for everybody in this place, God, as you're moving in our hearts and you're moving in in the depths of who we are, God, that that you do a work in us right now. That we not not only hear the word, God, but, but, but what we need to do is do what you're telling us to do. That is the key. Many people this morning are hearing a word from you in churches all over the world. God, I'm wondering how many will bring their children to you. How many will bring their cares to you? How many will do something about it? God, I pray that for the people in this place, if, if they're ready to surrender their life to you, man, I, God, I pray that they will come forward after, after the song. If anybody needs prayer, God, I pray that they will come forward. If anybody needs anything, I pray that they won't leave here. If they're hurting or struggling, let us love them and hug them and walk with them and show them your love because it's so good. Thank you for your love for children. They matter to us so much. They are the lifeblood of our church, God. I promise you, we will pour into the kids that you entrust in this church. We will love them the best that we know how with your love, not ours, your love. They deserve it. They need you. And it's our job as adults to point them to you, God. May may we do whatever it takes to point these little ones to you. 
that not one would perish, that they would know your love and know your forgiveness and know your mercy and know your grace. God, we love you. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody says, amen.